Okay, so welcome to this next video in, uh, well, welcome to this next video on in vivo gene cloning. Okay, so we've discussed uh, restriction endonucleases now, and now what I want to discuss is uh, the main topic of the video, which was in vivo gene cloning. So, we have used this ECOR1, which is an example of, a very famous example of a restriction endonuclease, which we uh, extracted from the bacterium uh, Escherichia coli. Right, uh, so uh, we've cut our desired gene out of our DNA with this restriction endonuclease, and now what we're going to do is implant it into this plasmid. So basically what's going to happen is this plasmid is going to come apart now, so if I draw it within itself, so this is obviously it has, it's shrunk in the picture, but never mind. It now has these two sticky ends, basically, so on this side it has an overhang which comes this side, and on this side it has an overhang on that side, okay? And I should have probably drawn the DNA as two strands, hmm, never mind. Um, okay, so now what we're going to do is take this gene here, which um, we've cut out. So we've now got a piece of DNA that looks kind of like this, where we've got completely complementary overhangs here. Uh, to the overhangs here. So I, I want to turn this into two strands because it just looks silly at the moment. Right, so we've got that one, and now it's going to look even worse because I've sort of mixed them up, but never mind. Okay, so you've got two strands there, and on this, in this plasmid, we've got an overhang here and an overhang here. And basically, this overhang here can interact with this overhang here, and this overhang here can interact with this overhang here. So basically, we're going to sort this gene in there. And we now make a recombinant plasmid. Okay, so let's say we've got our plasmid, which has um, a gene, has our gene that we have implanted in. So let's say this is the gene that we've implanted in. So this is now a recombinant plasmid. We now want to put it back into a bacterium. Okay, uh, so um, this process is known as transformation. The process of making the bacterium take up our recombinant plasmid is known as transformation of the bacterium. Okay, so we want to now perform transformation. Right, so we get our bacteria, and there is a problem, basically. So let's say this is our bacterial cell here. The problem is that the bacterial cell membrane is made up of a phospholipid bilayer, like all the other cell membranes. So if I draw a little bit of the phospholipid bilayer here, basically, the, the phospholipids have a polar head, which has a phosphate group at it, on, on its head, basically. And phosphate groups have a negative charge, so this portion of the phospholipid is negatively charged. The inner bits of the uh, membrane, the, the, these hydrophobic tails, they aren't charged, but the heads are negatively charged. Now, that's not idyllic for getting DNA in, because DNA also has absolutely loads of uh, phosphate groups on it. So DNA is negatively charged. So how do we get our plasmid through this cell membrane and into the cell, basically? Well, the way in which you do it is you put your bacterium in a solution containing absolutely loads of calcium ions. Uh, the reason is that calcium has a positive charge, and it doesn't just have one positive charge, it has two positive charges. So basically, calcium will uh, line the surface of your cell membrane. If you put it in a very high concentration of calcium, calcium will bind to these phospholipid heads and uh, neutralize the charge, basically. Also, DNA has a negative charge. The DNA will also be attracted to the calcium, basically. So the DNA is going to be around this cell membrane, basically. So if this is our plasmid here, it's, once we've put our bacterial cells in a very high concentration of calcium, the DNA can bear to get near the membrane. Before, it wouldn't go near it because the membrane was so negatively charged. But now the membrane's covered in calcium, then uh, the new negative charge is neutralized, basically. Okay, now what you do is you heat shock it. So you heat everything up, heat shocking. And basically, this somehow leads to, and I don't think it's fully understood, but basically it disturbs the membrane enough that these plasmids can end up getting through it, basically. So you heat it up generally to about 42 degrees Celsius, and uh, that leads to a disturbance in the cell membrane, which must lead somehow to the production of holes uh, through which uh, the plasmid can enter the cell. 
Okay, so now what we have is a transformed bacterium, a bacterium which has within its, uh, within its cytoplasm our recombinant plasmid here. Okay, so that's excellent. Here is our transformed bacterium. Now, uh, we, want to, um, we want to grow this bacterium on now, so we put it basically on an agarose gel plate. So here is a gel plate, and we put in agarose into here. But there's a problem. We want to make sure that these bacterium actually have taken up our recombinant plasmid. So how can we make sure that we're not just growing some horrible bacteria on this agarose plate? We don't want to be feeding horrible bacteria. We only want to be feeding our uh, transformed bacteria. We don't want, you know, our transformed bacteria to have competition. Uh, we just want the transformed bacteria to grow on this plate. So basically, there's an ingenious strategy for doing this. Basically, what you do is you put in uh, somewhere else on this uh, plasmid. You make sure that your recombinant plasmid also has a gene for antibiotic resistance against some certain antibiotics. So let's say it's got a gene for chloramphenicol resistance. Chloramphenicol resistance. So chloramphenicol is an um, antibiotic. Is it a chloramphenicol or chloramphenicol? Cal. I think it's like that. Chloramphenicol uh, resistance. Okay, so basically, um, if the bacterium has taken up our recombinant plasmid, it will have this gene for chloramphenicol resistance. So now what we do is when we make these agarose plates, when we pour on our molten agarose, we put within the molten agarose, we put loads and loads of chloramphenicol. Then, uh, this agarose plate will have loads of chloramphenicol in it. So only those bacteria which are resistant to chloramphenicol will be able to have a chance of growing on this plate. So only those bacteria which have taken up our recombinant plasmid and therefore also have our uh, gene for uh, chloramphenicol resistance will grow on our agarose plate. And that's a very clever idea, basically. So in this way, we can now put our bacterium onto here. All of the bacterium that failed to take up the recombinant plasmid are going to die because they won't have taken up this chloramphenicol resistance gene. And those that have taken up the recombinant plasmid, they will survive because they are resistant to chloramphenicol. Okay, so then what we do is we let them grow and divide and uh, produce more plasmids. So they produce lots and lots of plasmids. So they produce, uh, they grow, divide, and produce more plasmid. Divide and produce more plasmid. And now comes the sad part. We have to harvest this plasmid from the bacterium. Uh, produce more plasmid and basically it's not good for the bacterium. We have to break them apart basically to get the plasmid out. Uh, so um, what you do is you lyse the cells, you break up the cell membrane. So lyse cells. Uh, so that means that the cell structure is going to be broken down. So the cell membranes are going to burst. Uh, you're going to get a huge mush of cytoplasm and plasmids. So you get a uh, what's known as a lysate, which is basically just loads and loads of crushed bacterium. Uh, cell lysate. Okay, and in that cell lysate is going to be loads and loads of this plasmid that we want. Okay, so how are we going to get rid of all of the junk that we don't want, you know, all of the mitochondria, the cytoplasm, the endless um, microtubules, you know, and phospholipids that have came from the bio and all of that. How are we going to get rid of that and just get the DNA? Well, basically, the way that you do this is you put it through what's known as a silica column. So a silica column is exactly what it says on the tin. It's a column which is full of silica. So you have a column like so, and at the bottom you'll have some sort of drainage, which will uh, let the stuff come through. And basically you fill this column with loads and loads of silica particles. So loads and loads of silica particles. Now what is silica? Silica particles. Well basically it's another name for silicon dioxide. Silicon dioxide is what makes sand. So effectively silica particles are sand. Um, so if you've been to a beach, it's that stuff. Uh, so silicon dioxide, um, silica particles are silicon dioxide. So I'll show you the structure of silicon dioxide, and it's kind of similar to diamond. Silicon the, uh, is, a, is an element. Uh, denoted SI, and it's in the same, it's in the same, um, not row, column of the periodic table as carbon. So it likes to bind to four things, basically. And what it does is it binds to oxygen in the same way that carbon binds to itself in diamond. So it binds to four oxygens, basically, like so. 
And then what happens is that each of, the, each of these oxygens then binds to another silicon. So you might have another silicon down here, another silicon down here, another silicon like that. Then each of these silicons binds to another oxygen, basically. So you get three more oxygens coming off like this, off each of them. And basically you produce massive great lattices of this. And these some of these will share the same oxygens like that. Uh, so you get, end up with massive great lattices of silicon dioxide. And that forms these uh, great, huge, you know, these macroscopic particles which we see as sand. So you fill up this column with silicon dioxide particles or silica particles. And the reason you do this is because DNA binds to silica. Uh, it, uh, so what we can do is we can run our, sil uh, our cell lysate through this silica column. So this is a silica column. And uh, by doing that, uh, what will happen is that the DNA from the cell lysate will bind to the silica particles and all the other stuff will run straight through the column and can be collected in some sort of container and then thrown away. Okay, now what you'll do is you'll wash this to make sure that all the impurities have been removed. So, you, you know, when you run it through a thing of sand, what's going to happen? Loads of things are going to stick. And you only and the DNA binds, but loads of things are going to get stuck. So you're going to wash it off to make sure that all of the junk has got washed through. And then you're going to throw that away. So this goes away now. Now what we do is we put something through this column that causes the DNA to stop binding to the silica particles. This is known as elution, basically. So we put some elution um, fluid through, which will basically make the DNA stop binding to the silicon. Then if we put another container underneath here, what we will then collect off is elution fluid, and also the DNA will be in that elution fluid, because the elution fluid stops the DNA binding to the silicon particles, silicon dioxide particles and it then uh, runs through the silica common and we can collect it at the bottom here and then we have our DNA. Okay, so that is overall the process of um, in vivo gene cloning.